Um, welcome. Welcome to those of you that are, are joining us. Um, we are going to be bringing in a few more people in the next minute or two as we as we slowly get started. Um, don't forget to put uh, inside the chat uh, where you're from. Uh, we got Texas and we got Calgary. Um, awesome. It's so wonderful to see you. I, I recognize some names on here. The, a bunch of other the names are brand new to me. So that's also absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Um, okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about when the right time to hire a salesperson is. Uh, this, is um, th this is both from personal experience as well as from my own experience of, um, you know, just as being an employer as well. We'll talk a little bit about, um, about all of that as we, as we go get started um, going forward here. Oh, hello, uh, Edmonton, Edmonton, Okotoks. It's absolutely wonderful to see you all here. Um, and then I'm just making sure that uh, I'm not missing any doorbells. Every now and then I hear a doorbell that will allow more people to come on in. So I want to let you know, I mean, when it comes time to hire, you are likely going to go through a wide range of emotions, right? Everything from, I don't know if I'm ready to hire to, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. to this is probably the scariest thing that I can ever go through. Um, when I was, as I was growing my business, our, our business uh, KO Advantage Group will be officially three years old at the end of November. Um, it was about um, just around the January period of time. I had kind of started my, my little business on the side, but I hadn't actually made anything in, in really significant out of it. Um, and then uh, until that point in time, we had got on a couple brand new contracts, a couple new deals, and I was overwhelmingly busy. And I said to myself, oh my goodness, I absolutely need to hire somebody. I need to go ahead and have somebody come in and help me with all of this, all this work that I have, all of these leads that we're generating, all of this client engagement that we go through. And I remember knowing that that I needed to hire because there was no way that I was going to be able to scale my business to the levels that I wanted to be if I just allowed myself to be the only person that was going to be working through there. And so I posted a job, um, a job ad on, I, I think it was Facebook at the time. We'll talk about where some of the places that you could potentially list your job listing um, will be. And I posted on, on Facebook and I was overwhelmed with the number of people that came to me. And as a first time employer, I went through a ton of interviews and I booked every single person that was, you know, looked like they had some type of skill set in for a phone interview, which in hindsight was probably the worst thing to do. We, we've changed our process for hiring significantly significantly um, in order to help to expedite to that process because with with technology today whether that is a job board linkedin indeed monster uh, facebook whatever job board you want to uh, you know admit that you have or you'll be using a lot of those companies have made it far too easy to do a one click apply and I didn't realize this at the time, and I accepted a lot of people um, in for that first meeting. Now, the other scary thing that I faced at the time was that uh, was that I didn't know what I was actually looking for. I, I wasn't clear on what this person was going to do. All I knew that it was that I needed help. So I finally found somebody who was fit, felt like they fit enough, and I made her an offer. <sighs> And I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep for almost a week afterwards. And I couldn't sleep because all of a sudden I came to the realization that it wasn't just my family and my mouth to feed, but now someone else was fully reliant on their livelihood because of what my business did. Now, 
the good news story was that she lasted with me for a significant amount of time. Eight months for a very first hire, I think is a pretty good thing, right? And there are people that will last for, you know, a year, two years, 10 years in some cases. I was happy with where, where we ended things because at the end of the day, as my business continued to grow and expand, we came to the realization that what I had hired her for, for was not going to sustain us in the long term. And we needed to go ahead and silo ourselves even more. Her skill set was definitely directed toward that administrative type of business, but I also had her doing some lead generation, some phone calls, a little bit of sales. And as we continue to grow, now we're at a point where we have dedicated salespeople in, in our company and in our business. So what do I know about say, say hiring a salesperson and what can I help to teach you? So I want to be very clear. I am not going to be talking to you from a perspective of an HR um, outsourcing company. There's a lot of legality. There's a lot of contracts and paperwork and benefits that you're likely going to have to go through before you're ready to make an offer. So I want to be very clear that today's information is entirely opinion and not to be taken as legal advice. Okay. So we're, we're ending that right now. Um, the other thing I want you to understand is that from the experience of being a salesperson, I also have a lot of information to bring on what you as an employer should be looking for in a salesperson. So my very first sales career was actually working for Xerox. It was the first thing that I ended up doing right out of university. And it was something that I never, ever expected my life to actually take down as a path. I graduated with a degree in finance. I was meant to sit in front of spreadsheets all day. I was meant to go ahead and actually have more conversations with people just via email and, you know, click, click this spreadsheet and find out what. And when I was hired as a salesperson, I thought to myself, WTF, what the fudge? I don't really know what I'm doing. And Xerox, despite the fact that it is considered to have one of the best sales training companies in, in probably the world, I felt like I was drinking from a fire hose. They went in, it was very intensive. We went on a week long sales training boot camp. There was another week long product knowledge boot camp. So learning how to sell was a lot different than learning what to sell. That was actually two full weeks included. And every single year we would go through another full week of sales training. They were very intensive in knowing that you knew how to do this. And it was so involved that sometimes you just felt like, I don't even know what I'm going through. And the first six months that I worked for that company, I probably made just enough to pay for my salary. Yet Xerox saw this as a long-term play. And I tell you this as an expectation on as an employer, what is the expectation that you need to set for yourself and for your future employees? I worked for Xerox for about five years and I left that to work for another significant company. So over that period of time, I grew and I grew very fast and up through the ranks. And then I said, well, I think I've kind of reached my peak where I know where the path that I can go with this. I could eventually work my way up to vice president of, um, vice president of sales, maybe become a divisional manager or something else like that. I don't really know if that's really where I want to be. I'm going to try something different. And overnight I left that and literally a headhunter called me up and they said, I don't know who you are, but I have your name on a post-it note. And I was told that if I could find you, I was to hire you for Clarion. And I'm like, well, you found me. And he says, congratulations, we're going to give you a significant salary. And I'm like, awesome. This is exactly what I was hoping to get. And now I went from knowing, thinking I knew how to sell to all of a sudden feeling like, I don't know again. I am now dealing with a completely separate client base. I'm dealing with a completely separate technology. I'm dealing with completely separate conversations. And yes, in theory, I know how to sell, but putting me in a completely different situation, all of a sudden I felt like I don't really know anymore. I lasted in that company for a year. 
because what the differences was, was I was looking for a lot of support from that company. I could have succeeded if I would have stayed with them long enough. But what I felt was I was this lone wolf. The head office was in, um, it was in Ontario. So to put this into perspective, I was in Montana and they were out, everyone else was in New York, right? I was in Calgary and everyone else was in Cambridge, Ontario. And I felt like there was not enough for support for me to actually succeed in a lot of the client conversations. I moved that on into American Express and now I finally felt like I knew what I was doing. I was back to my own level of expertise. I was talking finance. I was talking financial statements. I was talking to business owners again of international conglomerates. And now I'm getting to, to a point where I'm like, okay, I got this whole sales thing mastered to leave there after a couple years and now know that I had this whole sales thing mastered because I could go ahead and start negotiating for a salary that really indicated what my worth was. I was probably one of the highest paid salespeople at Pure Later. And I don't tell this to impress you. I tell this to impress upon you how much you may have to pay if you're looking for somebody with a lot of sales experience. So we're going to talk about the differences between what you might be able to afford versus what you probably need and where are you going to land somewhere in the middle. Today, now we are teaching sales. That is our primary level of business. We teach sales process specifically to entrepreneurs and small business owners. I'll tell you a little bit more about our company at the very end of today. Um, we are, we hire sales. We are not hiring sales for you. I want to be very clear. We are not a sales placement company. We only hire our own salespeople internally. So I'm going to tell you from my own personal experience, what do I look for when I go to hire salespeople? What am I ultimately seeking and how have I compensated my sales team? This is just an opinion not to be used as what is going to be ultimately for your business, but rather as another perspective later on. Um, we've also curated today's presentation has been a curation. We put out a post in various social medias and internal groups that I'm a part of and I had over 250 business owners reply to the questions posed today on what are the things that they wish they knew when they hired their first salesperson. So this isn't just from me speaking to you. This is about a whole variety of different businesses, different industries, different leaders of companies. Everybody from the person who has five employees to the one who has now 2,000 employees. And what do they wish they could say to themselves if they could go back in time? And we're ultimately here to help you grow your sales, whether that is you as a solo salesperson or you growing your sales team, that is our mandate. Our job is to help you learn how to fish so that you can go ahead and collect as much of that revenue, as much of that growth as you possibly want. My, um, my name is Kim Orleski, as you may have already uh, found out. Um, I am LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow. Many of you might have actually found today's webinar on LinkedIn. If you don't follow us on our page, make sure you do so that you are updated on every single webinar Wednesday. We change the topic every single week. I am Success Magazine's most influential sales leader, or sorry, I am Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger. Um, I am the author of my third book, sell more faster and start up Canada's female entrepreneur of the year. So let's talk about hiring, hiring salespeople, hiring the people that we need for our company. Um, the chat is open. If you have any questions as we go through today's presentation, please write it in the chat. I will save time for the very end to address any questions that you have. Um, depending on how we get through today's presentation, I may even be able to actually answer your questions during the presentation. So if it comes up to you, immediately ask it because I want to be able able to make today's presentation as relevant to where you are as possible. So the three P's I have hiring, right? There, there's a, uh, if you took a business class, uh, you know, usually in university or maybe at some type of college, they'll usually talk about business as a very generic kind of conversation. And they call it the three P's of business. They say you have to have your product, your process, and your people. And if you have all three of those things in alignment, your company is going to soar to the sky. Now, the other thing about this is that it's not just business. It's really about 
hiring, hiring salespeople as well. If we think of this from the most simplistic terms, people process product, we want to make sure that every single one of these works in alignment. And this isn't something that is a cyclical type of conversation. It's not the people, then the product, then the process back to the people. But I look at this as rather a hierarchy or a pyramid, where when you have the foundation of the first one working really well, then you can add on the second one, then you can add on the third one. We cannot go ahead and just hire the people if we don't have a process for them to follow and we're not very clear on our product. So we want to work from the very bottom of this pyramid, create the foundation, and then build upon it as we can. So we're going to talk about your product, your process, and your people. Are you clear on where you're positioned in the market? Do you know what your standard sales process looks like? And then when you have it, it will make sense for you to hire the right person in order to get the results that you succeed. So let's talk about product first and foremost. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I'm going in with the assumption that you have a really clear product. You know what you are selling and you know who you are selling to. But rather, I want to speak of this from the, from the perspective of that you know who you're selling and you can take that model and give it to someone else in your company, right? Is it so clear? Is it written down? Is it articulate enough that someone else could say, I know exactly? Or do you feel like for you, it's very clear, but if you had to explain it to somebody, the fogginess starts to come up. And if you're foggy thinking about how am I actually explaining my product, my service, who I serve, where are competitive advantages in the marketplace, then you need to spend the, spend the legwork today making sure that you have the, the pieces in place so that when you are ready to hire, it's easy. You're setting your person up for success. So where do you fit? Uh, Jim Collins in his book, uh, From Good to Great, talked about this as the hedgehog. That little area in the, sec uh, the, the center of this Venn diagram is the hedgehog. And this was the intersection between what I'm good at, what's my passion, and what the market needs. For those of you that are solopreneurs, we should be able to articulate that. As we start to grow into small businesses, this is really more of the identity of the business. Um, at the very beginning, usually the identity of the solopreneur and the identity of the business is the same. And then eventually the identity of the business starts to take off and the solopreneur will become more of a leader in their organization and their identity will, will start to evolve. But this is your carved out space. And are you clear on who your ideal client is? And I put in brackets here, isn't, because we also want to be able to say we do not serve these types of clients. Or if the client does not fall on this side of the line, we can serve them if they come to us but we are not going to seek them out. So every, every quarter, me and my team will actually sit down. We do quarterly st strategy meetings. And we, one of the, the sessions that we'll typically talk about will be, you know, who is our market? Who do we serve? Because this is an evolution. Oftentimes we start in one place and it will continuously evolve. When I first started my business, I was sales training. Yeah, sales training, sales training for who needs it? You want it? We got it, absolutely. And eventually I started to carve it down. I said, okay, well, I'm not, I, I don't know car sales. So we're going to exclude that. I don't know real estate. So I'm going to start to exclude that. And we're going to get to this place where eventually we'll be B2B. But what does business to business actually mean? Well, maybe this is technology companies. Is it all tech or is it a very specific segment of tech? Is it consultants, marketing agencies, uh, HR outsourcing co uh, consultants, IT firms? Now we're starting to craft really who that clear vision is for our company. And if they're either here, they are a 95% of the way fit. And if they are excluded out of that, we're not going to seek them out. The other question you need to ask yourself is what does your client ultimately get from your services? If you can articulate that it's not, I'm not just providing you an IT services to give you better security for your computer. Yeah, that's okay. But everyone else is going to be like, oh, well, we do that too. We do that too. We do that too. How do you ultimately then say, 
how do we charge you for a premium? Now, not everybody on today's webinar is going to be positioned as a premium price provider, but my wish upon you is that one day you are. One day, if you're not today, that you become the premium price provider. And if you remember all those logos that I showed you at today's beginning of the presentation, the Xerox, the American Express, Purolator, all those companies had in common that they were all the top price in their market. There is a place for the top price provider as long as they're providing the service. And hopefully when you go to hire your salesperson, there's a value alignment from that. What you need to do at this point in time is to create a buyer persona. And if your buyer persona is not clear inside your own documentation, that is something that you need to work on. Um, if you don't have a template for them, uh, send me an email at the, today at the end of the webinar. We have a worksheet that we provide our students as part of our KO Sales U program. Um, I'll be happy just to send you our buyer persona template that you can go ahead and fill out. Um, otherwise, you can find plenty of them online. Just search out buyer persona or sometimes it's called client avatar. Uh, the other thing to know is how are you selling your services? When you sell your services as the solopreneur or entrepreneur, what does that process look like? And I use the description here, you don't sell a house over the phone. When we go to look for somebody who is ultimately going to act as a representation of our company and sell our products and services on behalf of us, we need to make sure that the person knows how to move through that very similar type of sales process. And if they don't have the experience of having that done before, are they coachable? Are they trainable? And are you willing to go ahead and put them through that process with you? Will they be shadowing you? What will that look like? Because the last thing you want is maybe someone with sales experience, but their sales experience included telephone sales. Boom, 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 boom. Maybe the person is super introverted. And I, I do believe that you can have um, introverted people actually be some of the best sales people. But I do want to also make sure that if they are to meet with me in person, or in this case, maybe via Zoom, can they actually hold a conversation? Can they go ahead and drive me to the ultimate outcome that I want? Because as you look at your product or service, usually the higher the price that you want to capture in the market, the more time that you're going to have to be involved in different types of meetings. So you might have one meeting with one person throughout the entire conversation. You may choose to have multiple meetings with different influencers and decision makers in an organization. What does that process typically look like for you? And what the best thing to do is take a look at what you did over maybe your last three or five sales cycles and ask yourself, how did this lead come to me? What was the initial interaction? What happened then? What happened then? Then we proposed, then we closed. And what was involved in each one of those? And we want to start testing people when we get to the, per the person portion. We want to start testing them and making sure that they have the skill set or at least the ability to try and push themselves over the, out of the comfort zone. You don't want somebody who only wants to communicate via email if all your client interactions include you being in person, include you being as a part of a conversation. When your person does start with you, you want to ask yourself, what am I going to give them to start? When, when I look at my own business, what is the base that I already have? Am I going to give them something or am I going to give them nothing? Am I giving them a list of clients? Am I giving them an ideal client fit? Am I giving them what that buyer persona looks like? How am I helping to give them the map? that will allow them to become um, successful. And are we gonna take the conversations that I've had, maybe some of the ones that have not turned into sales at this point in time, are we transitioning them over? Or are we, are we including people outside of that? Are we splitting this list up? 
what makes sense to you. In our company, we, we go ahead and we generate a ton of leads. And then as the leads come through, I go ahead and carve out different leads according to geography for the three different salespeople. I'm one of the salespeople and then we have two other salespeople. We'd carve out the three different salespeople on which, who is going to take which conversations. But perhaps your business doesn't fit that way. Perhaps your business, I've seen um, an engineering company where they went ahead and they had their own list of 100 clients and then they created a brand new list of 100 clients so that they gave them something. When I worked for Xerox, American Express, uh, Clarion and Purelator, all four of those companies gave me a list to start off with. What I don't have included in there was there was a blip in the radar where I actually worked with a marketing agency startup and the marketing agency startup was not successful in this and I asked them who do you sell to and they said we sell to everybody and as a young 20 something I was like awesome well yeah let's sell to everybody of course that makes sense everybody needs a website and only to find out after 30 days I was exhausted my my list included the yellow pages start there start here, wherever you want to start. And we were, we were the jack of all trades and ultimately the master of none. And what the company ended up doing was actually setting me up to fail. By thinking that I had a blank canvas, now the world is my oyster, I actually didn't have a focus to go after. So make sure that when you, when you are ready to hire the person, number one, that you have your own list curated. Are you splitting that out and creating a brand new list for somebody or are we generating conversations? Are we transitioning conversations going on? And you want to also understand your competition, right? Anybody who hasn't sold in a competitive environment, um, if you are constantly in a competitive environment, they need to know what does that look like? How do we talk about the competition or do we? I come from the school of thought that talking about the competition doesn't actually serve your purposes ultimately. It's good to know kind of what they do, but for the most part, talk about talk to your clients as if it's how can we serve you even better as opposed to this or this. Yeah, you can go with them, but I'll tell you all the reasons why you don't want to go with them and why you want to go with them. It has never served me, even in corporate sales. But you should know what your competitive advantage is. What do you stand for? And what did you do when you were in a competitive situation or you were up against somebody? Why did you win or lose in that case? And how do you articulate that to somebody? Are you clear? Have you done your own postmortems from your own own sales cycles. If you haven't done that, when you bring somebody in to sell on behalf of you, how will they know what are some of the techniques and conversations that will be drivers to success versus tech, um, conversations that might delay the conversation ultimately? Now, one of the reasons why a lot of people believe that they, are, they have a competitive advantage over their competitors, um, Gartner Research did a study and they said 89% of companies claim they provide a better service than their competitors. Our clients go with us because we're, we serve them better. I want to be very clear on this because if 89% if of companies believe that the reason why you will choose to buy with me is because I serve you better, but the other nine out of 10 companies that you're comparing me to all say the same thing. Is that really your competitive advantage? Or are you just saying the same thing as, oh, well, we do that too. We serve our clients better too. We serve our clients better too. So get really crystal clear on what your competitive advantage is. You can do this by interviewing some of the clients that you're already working with, maybe some of the prospects that uh, when they first reach out to you, what was it about you know, our company that made you reach out? Where did you find us? What have you heard about us? Find that out. That's really good research to have so that when you're ready to hire somebody, you will go through this. Now, we go in this very in-depth into KO sales use so that you know what this process looks Looks like, but you should have this available for your other people. And are your clients, if you are a solopreneur or you are a small business where you are ultimately the only one as the business development person, are people buying from you because of who you are? Or are they buying from you as in like the royal you, the royal we? We're buying from you as a company. 
I need you to understand what the difference is. Are you being very clear on your product or service offerings or have you in the past created a lot of customized solutions? Are you doing creative promises? Are you getting most of your leads and your conversations starting from referrals? Which will then tell me that typically that is because of where people are coming from you, right? They, they believe, I believe John is the best person for me and I will go to John, which then will make it really harder for him to pass the torch onto somebody else. Because even though John is going to have this brand new sales rep, Brianna, I don't typically want to go to Brianna because John is the person that I've worked with. From personal experience, this is one of the hardest things that we, as a company, I had to start to work and transition away from. This happened twice in our own organization. The first one was when people found out that I don't teach every single class. <gasps> What do you mean? Like you, you're the creator of the content. What do you mean that you're not teaching the classes? No, the class works. The program works. The process works. Eventually we got through that. The second time we faced it was when I started to transition people to not talk to me in their sales conversations, but to talk to someone else who represented my company. And that was, I, I will tell you also from personal experience, this was also a really hard moment for me. The, the teaching one was easy because I'm like, awesome. Finally, we're starting to scale. The, the business development conversations, the sales conversations were really difficult because what that meant was that I didn't have control over what was being portrayed or the conversation that somebody else was having. Okay, number two, your process. We need to have the process so, so leveled out that anybody who jumped into that role could immediately pick up and run with it. So what are the steps that you need someone to follow? How are they going to generate new leads if you need them to? So we'll talk about, you know, what kind of roles you're going to have for somebody to do. What tools do you need so that they are successful in that new role? And now what is the role of you as the sales manager? I want to be clear here. The sales manager still sells. They do not walk away entirely from the business conversation. And I speak of this from personal experience too, because that is a bad place to be as well. Okay. So the questions you need to ask yourself before you go ahead, what skills do I need this person to be? Do I need them to be a hunter or a farmer? Do we already have a great list of companies that we're already working with? And I just need them to nurture those conversations. Do I need them to take the clients that we're already working with and be able to, to take over those relationships and cross sell and upsell and eventually build or the, what we call the share of wallet, build the share of wallet, the amount of revenue we're getting at per client basis and ultimately help that. And maybe my job will be to actually go out and buy new leads. Do we want the person to be the hunter? The hunter is essentially has no, no basis on which to start from and they're out there hustling. They're sending LinkedIn in-mail requests. They're sending phone calls, emails, uh, you know, cold calls, networking their butt off, handing out business cards as if they're Drake at the six. Whatever it is, right? What are you looking for? And maybe it's a combination of both. Are you going to incentivize someone a little bit different? My personal experience, I loved being both the, the hunter as well as the farmer. I liked having a balance of the two, but that's me personally. There are some people that just love to hunt. They love to go out there and get out there and get out there. I love just meeting new people. They have this thing about just getting out there for the newness. There's other people who like the, the in-depth relationships. And I feel much more comfortable knowing that this person already is familiar with our company. What are you looking for? Are you selling something very technical? Do you need them to have a certain level of technical skills or be able to actually have a conversation at a certain way? An engineering company may look for somebody who has at least an engineering background. So we can have a very similar conversation. But re remember that the higher the skill set and the technical ability that you're going to get somebody, the more you may have to pay. 
right? And what is it going to look like to be successful in this role? When you look at your own sales conversations and how you got from point A to point B, how did I go from zero revenue to a point where we're generating 10, 20,000 a week, a month, whatever that is, how did you get ultimately get there? Well, how many calls were you having to make? How many meetings did you have? And how do you get someone to mimic your success? Because what we want to look at is, I mean, ultimately, what do McDonald's, Starbucks, and like Mr. Lou, right? You know, the the, um, the the oil change company all have in common, right? They all follow a specific process. They have a binder and they say, follow this binder and you will always get to success. Telecom companies or tele, telephone sales companies will typically do that. They write down every single answer that they want somebody to follow. And if the person goes here, they go, they flip over the tab and they start reading the script and if the person goes here they flip over the tab and they start reading the script if a scripted salesperson is what you want then you need to have the script first most businesses though especially high value service providers we don't want scripted sales but we do want people to follow a very specific process. You're gonna have this type of meeting and here's the questions or at least the information I need you to gather. In your next meeting, this is the information that you'll need to gather. And then when you're ready to propose, bring me in and we will have the proposal together, whatever that looks like, but it has to be outlined. Because if, if I'm coming brand new into your organization and I don't even know what I'm doing. I want to know that at least I'm on the right tracks, right? As long as your, your person, your salesperson follows the process, they will get the, the result. And this could be um, a, a full-time salesperson or in my very first hire, this was just, I, just somebody enough to qualify the leads as they came in. We would get so many leads sometimes and all her, all her job was is to call people up and ask them for the meeting, right? Get the meeting and then book my calendar with meeting, 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 meeting. And therefore I would go in there, right? Maybe you're having somebody do a few different roles, but think about which part at least can you automate or which part can you hand on to somebody else? And how many leads do you need to ultimately close? If you're getting somebody to that's going to be that hunter, right? They're, they're searching out there, right? Number one, we've given them a really well-defined buyer persona. This is who we're ultimately looking at. This is the, the level of seniority that that person is. Here's some titles that we'll typically be looking for. Uh, maybe a geography that we want to focus on or a couple. Okay. How many leads do you need them to do? How are you going to measure their success? One of my favorite questions to ask uh, brand new uh, businesses when they're ready to start hiring on salespeople or maybe they're growing themselves and they're getting to a point where they're creating a brand new team is in the absence of revenue, how will you know the person is successful? Because it may take a little while for them to start paying off of their themselves for what you're paying them. It may take them a little while for them to generate the results. So in the absence of them ultimately making the sales, which yeah, we want that, how will we also determine that this is a success that we want to be able? Is it going to be by the number of phone calls? Is it going to be the number of in-person meetings, Zoom meetings, proposals, um, perhaps it's just you know phone calls or emails? If someone did this all day, right, how much would we expect them to generate? Because the reality is, is that when you hire, if you're hiring a full-time salesperson, um, we would expect them to probably do somewhere between three to four times, maybe even five times the amount that we personally as business owners, as founders are capable of doing because we have a lot of other things to do, right? We're, we're servicing our clients. We are doing administration. We're following up with our accountants. We are doing all sorts of different things. If somebody only had one aspect, the 20% of our role as salespeople and was doing that as 100% of their role, what is that increase that we do? And is that realistic, right? That's the other thing to ask yourself. If you're too narrow in your, your scope of who your ideal client is, it may not be realistic for them. And so we may have to look at a transition. You want to make sure that you're setting your people up for success. So if you don't currently have a CRM, it stands for Customer Relationship Management Tool, 
you must, must, must get one before you ever hire a salesperson. I do not want you to ever hire somebody and you are currently using Google Sheets to keep up to date on all of the different clients that you're having conversations with. Oh, that is terrible. That is terrible because it doesn't automatically save the same type of information. There is no follow-up. There is no uh, tasks assigned. There is no notifications. And realistically, human error is one of the biggest things that will cause you to fail in your company. And how easy would it be for somebody to select the entire spreadsheet and go, delete? I hope you all just had a mini heart attack. Like I, like I, the thought of it, like gives me like anxiety. Um, so you must have a CRM. Now there's plenty out there, right? And there's, there's plenty out there that are free or no cost um, or low cost. Uh, I, I am personally a fan of HubSpot. I am a HubSpot partner. I'm actually speaking at their event inbound in two weeks time. Uh, so do, check us out. If you're wanting to attend uh, is one of the largest marketing and sales conferences in North America, um, contact me. We actually have a code to get a ticket for $49 instead of, I think, whatever they have it listed for $119 for the two days of sessions. Um, so it's, um, I am a HubSpot um, partner. I do believe in it, but you can go with Salesforce. You can go with Pipedrive. You can go with um, like Sugar, CRM. There, there's no lack. Find what works for your business and start using that. And understand what is the information that you want to share. Because as somebody comes into this role, we're gonna want them to update their daily activities. We're gonna want them to write down tasks on what they've done for their meetings and emails and phone calls. When that person leaves, the reality is at some point they're going to leave. When that person leaves, do you have access? Can you pick up where they left off? Either you or maybe you all, you're you fortunate enough that you already have the next hire in place that they can pick up. But the reality is for most of us as small business owners, as entrepreneurs, when your salesperson leaves, there is no plan B. Plan B is you. And can you continue to generate the information, generate the revenue, generate the meetings where you can just pick up and continue on? Because spending two weeks to try to replace somebody and not generating any revenue is not going to be a, uh, a, a like, is not going to be the ideal situation that you want to be in. And then your role is going to transition. As you start to hire salespeople believe below you, you never want to completely remove yourself from revenue generation. Um, Michael Gerber in his book, E-Myth, talked a little bit about this. And he, he talked about the differences between accountability and responsibility. And he says, you're gonna have lots of people underneath your organization that are going to be responsible for, for helping to generate, right? At the end of the day, the salesperson is responsible. That is your your sole responsibility. You have one job. Your job is to go out and generate revenue. As the business owner, though, we are ultimately accountable for a lot of whether it happens or not. Because the reality is, is I might have a salesperson who is responsible for generating revenue. And if they are on a commission plus salary, if they're on a base and they don't generate the revenue, who's paying them? I'm the one who's ultimately accountable. I can't go to my rental. Um, I can't go to my office and say, listen, you know, uh, Lisa, um, I can't pay you rent this month because my salesperson didn't sell anything. Can you believe it, right? No, my, the, my landlord is gonna say, well, no, your lease is in your name. You are ultimately accountable to pay me. I don't care whether your salesperson did something or not. Now try to talk to any one of the companies, whether that is your telecom company, whether that is your internet service provider, whether that is your CRM subscription, whatever it is, and tell them that you can't pay because someone else was responsible for generating the revenue and they just missed their target. Can you believe it? At the end of the day, every single person will be like, that's not our problem. That problem, that sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. So you wanna make sure that you are ultimately have, you know exactly who you're gonna be able to talk to. Okay? Your, your salesperson will ultimately be someone who should be working on the smaller, the transactional deals, and allow you to continue to push yourself up. Allow you to push up to the bigger deals, the strategic deals. 
And now I told you I was going to tell you from personal experience that this happened to me. One of my, um, I think it was like my second or my third salesperson. I can't, uh, I can't um, remember exactly which one it was, but, uh, but I was so excited. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've hired my very first full-time salesperson. <gasps> Isn't this amazing? Now I ultimately get to do what I want to do, right? I, I mean, I, I, love, I love doing the sales, don't get me wrong, but the role I want for myself is I want to be a curator of content. I want to be the creator of content. I want to be speaking on stages. That's all I want to do. And what ended up happening was she was out there and she's hustling and she's hustling, she's selling, she's selling, but sometimes she wasn't selling. And then we ran into cash flow issues because she was the only one selling. I moved myself away from the business. And when the cash flow issues hit, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I panic set in. I have to get on the phone. I have to get on the phone. I have to try to close with really quick, quick deals. I moved myself away instead of what I should have been doing was pushing the envelope and working for bigger deals. I couldn't work on as many, but the few that I could should be worth four to 10 times the amount that hers were ultimately worth. And, and this is actually something that I saw every single company I worked for, right from Xerox to American Express, right to the president of the organization. If you ever ask the, if you ever get a chance to meet like the president of American Express, you can ask them, which accounts are they personally responsible for? Every single leader of the organization had their own list of accounts that they were ultimately responsible for selling into. Everyone had a sales role inside the organization. It was not just the salespeople. Okay, we're going to wrap up with people here now. We're now we're at the top of the pyramid. Once you have the product clear, you have the process clear, if you're still unsure, if, if one of those two elements doesn't feel right right now, where you're not sure if you have it completely clear, um, I want you to contact uh, me and my team, right? Just have a conversation with us. Let's see if you are clear. Let's see if you, you need a little bit of additional help. I'll give you a meeting link at the end of today's webinar as well for you to go ahead and check out. Let's talk about people. Okay. People is usually the first thing that we think about, but at the end of the day, we've just learned that that should be the last one. But now that we, we get clear on that product and process, we need to know how much should I pay the person? How do I even find that right person? And how long is it going to take for them to pay themselves off? Okay. So how much should I pay? One of the, the funniest things I'll ever see, I, I try to stifle my, my laugh out loud. <laughs> when, when somebody says, Kim, I don't need to learn sales. I'll just hire a salesperson. And I'm like, awesome. How are you going to pay them? And they're like, I don't need to pay them. They're going to work on 100% commission. And I'm trying to like, oh my goodness. Like, are you kidding me? 100% commission. Because the only time 100% commission works is number one, if you are doing enough work that it's easy for the person to close, Number two, within the first 30 days, they can go ahead and actually make themselves a fairly decent wage or at least some money. We need them to have a taste for it, right? And then ultimately at 100% commission, they can get themselves to a place where they can actually make a significant uh, wage, right? Remember, this is talking about risk versus reward and nobody is going to take on the risk of do I get paid or don't I get paid? If there isn't a significant reward at the end of this for me to like make crazy money, 10,000 plus per month as an employee. So you need to find, find out what does that potentially look like? Most companies, especially if you are in the relationship sale type of business, you will probably have to do a base plus commission. You will have to give them a, a small salary with a commission structure on top of that. And this will vary depending on company to company, but usually your base is, you know, just enough to like allow the person to survive. I don't want them to live a frivolous lifestyle. I just want them enough to survive unless your sales cycles are significant. So when I worked for companies like American Express and Purolator, my base was quite large, right? We're talking about like a six digit base because some of these sales cycles, like these relationships with international oil and gas conglomerates, they would be two years of relationship. They would be, you know, the responses of RFPs. They would, would typically be like months, if not years in the making. And so they needed to say, we need you to be focused on the relationship for long enough that when it hits, you will still be incentivized to know that this is something you're working towards. 
Um, if your if your uh, revenue is, is something a little bit lower than that, in, in the product that you sell is like maybe in like the less than one hundred thousand dollar range, you should be able. Hopefully, you're able to actually close deals within ninety days. And if you're not, then you know definitely have a conversation with us because we'll show you how to actually speed up that sales cycle so that it is happening in a faster in a faster turnaround. But after sixty or ninety days, can you as a company? still be profitable. If you are paying this person month after month and then they don't make a sale for the first 90 days and then day 91 or even day 89, they finally make a sale, will you be able to be paid back for the amount of salary that you've put towards them plus make a little bit in return? Now, the other thing you can look at is something called a draw. Um, a draw basically gives them a base and then you actually deduct any commissions from that base. Um, so it works a little, it look, works similar, but basically I don't pay you for the first, you know, X dollars in revenue. I don't pay you for the first X dollars um, until you've made up for that. And then you can get, you get your incentivized above that. Watch out for things like commission caps. I think they're really unfair. That's my personal opinion. Um, and you have to decide on what it makes sense for your business. Are you paying on revenue? Are you paying on profit margin? Are you paying maybe a flat rate per product or service? That will entirely depend on your business. So other incentives and costs might include things like maybe instead of going with a commission structure, instead of saying, listen, we're going to pay you as a percentage of every sale you make, maybe you just decide on going with a monthly or an annual bonus, right? If you do four transactions, regardless of the size, then you can hit a bonus, right? Um, perhaps maybe if you bring in X dollars in revenue, no matter when it happens, whether it happens in the last three, three months of the year, or if it happens over the course of a year, you get some type of annual bonus. Those are some things that you can potentially look at. Um, it also will work in combination between you, maybe your base with commission and then a bonus on top of that. Um, and bonuses can also be uh, looked at in different ways. At Xerox, we had a quota bonus. So once they would set our quota, and once you got to 100%, you would get an additional 2% or 3% above every piece of sale beyond that. Um, and so that was quite, quite significant, um, where they only pay you on everything for so every product had its own its own profit margin and then you would only get paid on a profit margin above that american express would pay us as a percentage of transaction so you need to figure out what makes sense to your business um, you'll have, what, do you have sales quotas? Is there a culture? Are you offering four day work weeks? Are you offering maybe some sales tools or technology? Are you giving the person a computer or a, uh, a laptop, a cell phone, which I always highly recommend. Those are your assets. Um, but maybe you're giving them a car bonus. Maybe you're giving them other things that they might need. Um, but really look at this as an incentive to drive the behaviors that you want to see from the person. Ask yourself, if I incentivize this, is it going to drive the right behaviors? If I incentivize just on booking meetings, I had one person who's like, I just want to get, hire someone just to book me meetings. Great, right? So now that they've booked you meetings, how are you going to ensure that they're the right meetings? Are you paying a per meeting? Or are you incentivizing them on qualifying the meeting? Maybe you change it so that if it's qualified, um, they get a different percentage, right? Versus an unqualified meeting. Maybe if the, the meeting eventually closes, you incentivize them in that. Ask yourself, because remember, people will always look for the shortest distance to the dollar ask yourself if if this was me right how would how would I try to maximize my incentive in order to get there um, and then training training is a great incentive especially for companies that uh, you know especially when we're small we don't have a lot to offer if you offer a really good training program or an opportunity for them to shadow you you talk about listen you work with us and you have an opportunity to learn entrepreneurial skills that can actually be a really good incentive for people. But don't hire somebody because they're so excited to work with you to learn entrepreneurial skills and then get upset when they leave to start their own business. And you want to create a carrot and a stick model, okay? So the carrot and the stick essentially means that when you compensate the person, um, you want to have the, the compensation just a little bit ahead of them instead of paying it out right away. One of the things that you don't want to do is when the person makes a sale, you're immediately having to do a funds transfer and paying that commission. Typically, you want to have somewhere between a, uh, a 5, 15, even 30 days. I've seen some companies do it in 90 days. 
um, they'll pay 90 days out in order to ensure that I've made this sale and now I'm going to wait to make sure the customer is well taken care of. It also prevents the, the client from getting any type of buyer's remorse um, account management and helps you ultimately with cash flow. You want to wait till the revenue comes in before you pay, you pay it out. And what does it really cost to hire? This is an interesting one because people don't understand. They think, well, I could just hire somebody. Like, that's, that's fine. But if you had to buy a new computer, right, you did a cell phone with a plan, and we're just talking about the first 90 days here. Let's say you pay them a fairly, you know, minuscule type of salary, just enough to get them by, right? $3,000 a month. We put post of the job listing, which costs us $100, and then $50 for technology. Maybe that's a CRM subscription. Maybe that's to add them onto your Google Drive. Maybe that is to add them to any other tech, technology subscriptions that you might have, it could cost you $11,000 just to hire the person. And they may never bring in a dollar of revenue. Are you prepared for that, right? Are you ready to take on the risk? And hopefully if you have the right process in place, you start to increase the level of success that the person will get. But I need you to be prepared on you know, what happens if it doesn't happen. And this is one of my favorite questions to ask. People are like, where do I find the unicorn? Oh, Kim, where do I find a unicorn? And I'm like, great question. Where do I find a really good salesperson? Where do I find a salesperson like you? And I'm like, great, where do you find the unicorn? Okay, ask yourself, is experience required? Remember what I said earlier today, right? Is that if you require experience, you will have to pay more for that experience. This is the difference between the mechanic who changes the, uh, the, the car, they hear the tick, 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 and they go in, they change the part, you know, in 10 minutes. And like, that's awesome. That's $10,000. Versus like, what do you mean $10,000, right? Like you took you 10 minutes and he goes, no, no. He's like, the part itself was easy. He's like, it took me 30 years to get to the experience where I knew in 10 minutes I can do this. If you're paying for that level of experience, know that you have to pay for that level of experience. When you hire, you wanna hire on your values. So think about understanding what are your company values, even list that inside the job description. Have that as the first few things that you wanna put in there. Because if people read that, they're like, oh yeah, I'm totally a relationship person. I totally give more. Or maybe you're a fast paced company. Yes, I'm a fast paced company, I'm a fast paced person. Hire on the value fit and then know that you can also train for the skill set later. Who is going to be doing that training? Is it going to be you? Is the person going to shadow you? Or are you going to be like, hey, here's a fire hose, go drink from it. Um, is it going to be someone else, right? Are you going to like maybe hire a training company? Do you have a cousin, a sister, a, um, I don't know, a neighbor that knows sales that will work with that person to get to that point where they're generating sales for you? Or are you choosing to do no sales and or, sorry, no training and saying, you know, we're just going to find out if this person is a fit or not set your people up for success don't hire and then be jaded by the hiring process because you didn't give them the tools that they needed how long is this going to pay off right this is always one of my, my favorite questions that people say so your own sales success should help to determine the other person's success the reality is you as a business owner, you are passionate. You know your product and service inside and out. You know your clients inside and out. It is going to be faster for you. So if whatever your typical sales cycle is and you had to double it, right? We want people to work longer and ultimately get the sale than to try to rush through every single process. We wanna make sure that they can still produce. So find out what your average sales cycle is and then ask yourself, if I had to pay this person for double the length of time, could I sustain it? By putting pressure on an employee who's not performing is actually going to be detrimental to your business, not help to get them to succeed because they're going to go out there and they're going to provide your clients a lower level of service. And when they leave the company, who is going to be facing the brunt of that? That is you. You are the one that's going to have to do this. So you're going to know whether this is going to work out in three to six months. And then the ugly truth is at some point the person's going to leave, right? 
from personal experience, I've had a client call me up and said, Kim, I know you hired a new salesperson. Um, I don't really think she's a good fit for your company. <gasps> oh my goodness. This actually happened. Oh my goodness. Like I had to have a conversation with this woman. I'm like, what was the conversation? I immediately had to fire her. Right. So, I mean, the reality is you are going to have to let somebody go. Um, are you prepared to take over the sales role until you're ready to hire again? It may take you a little while. Maybe you just outlaid $11,000 for that last hire and you're not there yet. You're going to have to build up that base for the next 90 days before you're ready to hire again. Are you comfortable in knowing? There's a lot of experience you can take from this. Okay, some quick final thoughts that didn't quite fit into all the experience that I got from all these business owners. Get your product and process in first. Hire right the first time. Make sure your pieces are in, in, um, in systematized. Um, create a hiring funnel the same way you would create a client's funnel, right? You know, who are you pulling from experience? And when you are in the interview process, when you can mimic a sales situation that you've been in and see how the other person reacts, that can actually help you to determine how they will actually respond when they're in a live situation. Our company, we help you get relief in knowing that you have the right sales process in place. So whether this is you learning for yourself or you to ultimately be the trainer for your own organization, I promise you, you are going to have what you need. We're also going to give you more empowerment in predict getting better and more predictable cash flow and revenue. And isn't that what you want? You want to know what you're going to be able to sell in the next 90 days. And we're dedicated to entrepreneurs and people like you that are selling premium services for premium profits. If, uh, if you want these steps, if you're looking for that process, go to kimorleski.com slash KO webinars. You can have that entire sales cycle journey. Um, and there's going to be ways to connect with us more. I'm also going to put our meeting request here in the chat. Um, it's bit.ly slash KO dash meetings, bit.ly, um, which will allow you to, uh, me meeting, meetings, I can't remember, um, which will allow you to go ahead and actually get, um, you know, sit down with us. Let's, let's talk this through. Why do we do this? Because our value, our number one value in our organization says you can have everything you want in life. If you help enough people get what they want. I hope that resonates with you because we're always, we're always trying to get people what they want. We don't sell sales training, like sales hiring services. We're not here to help place salespeople. We brought this information to you because you said that you wanted it. So I went out and I found you the information. I will do this again and again. That is my promise to you. And like all of our sessions, like all of our KO sales, you classes, I want to find out what is one thing that you're taking away from today. There was a lot of information. Oh my goodness. I opened up a beast, a can of worms when I got into this one. Um, I put in the chat, what is one thing that you're taking away from today? Um, and let me know, are you, are you going to connect with us? Have you connected with us in the before in the past? Because I am so grateful that you're here today. I know that you had options when it came to how you were going to spend your Wednesday afternoon. And I am so happy that you chose to spend it with us. I hope that uh, you got exactly what you sought out. I hope you, your hand is sore from the number of notes. I promised you there was going to be a ton of notes. Um, I hope you are able to get that. And if you want to talk more about those first two pillars of the, of the, the, the hiring process, the, uh, oh, the link doesn't work, says Vlad. Okay, let me just try this again. bit.ly slash ko meetings. Um, if uh, I know Mike and Nizi are on the, on the call, if you can actually just post in a full meeting link, that would be great. Um, uh, you, what, um, if you're, you're needing help, just really getting clear on your product, who am I selling to? How am I selling to them? Um, what is our competitive advantage? Um, maybe the process, the, the one, the, the steps that someone would have to follow. How do you follow that process? How do you teach someone to follow that process? please do connect with us because we want to work with you. We want to help you get what you need so that you are achieving whatever you set out for 2020, whether you are going to achieve that goal or you are not going to achieve it. Make sure whatever that goal is you want for 2021, if we start with you today, you know you're going to get there.
right? I'm, I want to be the example that sets out for you. And we have plenty of clients that have set that example. Um, thank you, Claudio. Yeah, accountability versus responsibility. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, Margaret um, says in here, the correct process, I would be struggling and failing without this. Yes, thank you so much. You definitely need, definitely have the right process. Um, yeah, Michael Curtis says, yeah, I've connected with these things. I'm so glad. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it is, it is a, it's these, all these little things. And sometimes we're, we hear it and then we hear it and we hear it. And then the fourth time we heard it, we're like, oh yeah, I really should implement that. Uh, that's, I mean, yes, thank you. Right. And uh, I, I think Mike is also a, uh, a proponent that if you haven't connected with us, you definitely need to, because uh, between me and my team, we are a wealth of knowledge. Um, Claudio is also interested in the HubSpot event. Yes, I will uh, make sure. So Claudio, and I think Tamara, you put something in the chat as well that you're interested. I will get you the, um, our, our link as well for the HubSpot event. I speak on the 23rd. Um, so I think it's a Tuesday, Wednesday event and I'm speaking on the Wednesday. Uh, I don't know if my team can just put that out there. Um, yeah, Maddie, you are absolutely welcome. Um, yes, you're right. We need to figure out who our clients are. Um, can you please quickly clarify the, on the use of Google Forms? Um, Google Forms in terms of, of hiring or applications. Um, I've never used Google Forms um, for, for hiring people before. Um, you can use Google Forms in terms of like curating content. The only time we've ever used Google Forms is like for things like client surveys and things like that. Um, the only reason is because I like to know that there is a certain um, arm's length between me and the, the provider. Um, yeah, thank you, Michael. I appreciate the endorsement as well. And then, yeah, okay, awesome, Jenny. So what we'll do is we'll probably, on top of sending you the recording from today's webinar, we'll also send you the HubSpot link. Um, get that booked in your calendar. It's going to be an amazing event. And for those of you that are um, fangirls, uh, I heard Chrissy Teigen and um, John Legend are actually going to be the keynotes for that event. Ah! So exciting. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm heading off now, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. I truly, I appreciate every single one of you. It's, um, it's been an absolute, um, an absolute pleasure having you here today. Bye-bye.